All right, welcome everybody. Um, on a world spinning its way to damnation amidst the fear and despair of a broken human race. Who is left to fight for what's good and pure? That's right, it's time for Night Rule. For a 35th Night Rule, we're extremely honored and pleased to be joined by a very talented author, Mr. David Austin. And we're going to be talking about poetry and in particular, I think the, uh, the work of one Linton Kwesi Johnson. So welcome, uh, welcome David. Well, thank you, my pleasure to be here. Yeah, so great to have you on Night Rule. Um, I was personally really lucky, and I, I, ha I have to give a shout out to my 11th grade English teacher who introduced me to uh, LKJ. I think there's probably a lot of listeners out there that they hear the name Linton Kwesi Johnson, and they're like, I don't know what the, who, who that is. Maybe just in terms of broad strokes for the audience, um, and, and you mentioned, this is mentioned on the back of the book, on the back of the jacket, for Johnson, only the second living poet to have been published in the Penguin Modern Classics series. Writing has always been a political act and poetry a cultural weapon. Maybe at just a high level, we can talk, we can start off by talking about the impact or maybe just give people a, a general idea of, of Linton Kwesi Johnson and his work. Sure. Well, I, I guess I'd begin by saying that Linton Kwesi Johnson is what has been described, what he described actually in relation to another Caribbean poet, uh, the great uh, Martin Carter, as the political poet par excellence. That is to say, He's a poet, which speaks to art and aesthetics, but somebody who has committed his life to politics and social transformation. Um, from his late teen, early 20s, uh, when he started publishing poetry, you know, up until the 1990s, because he hasn't published a great deal um, since. Um, and even just as a public intellectual, like you often see his voice or hear his voice or see his face in the Manchester Guardian or hear him on the radio. Um, he's been that poet who, yes, began writing poetry to sort of capture the feelings, aims, aspirations of Black folks in the UK of his generation in the 1970s. But when you trace the sort of trajectory and the arc of his poetry, you realize that he has captured some of the most important historical moments of the last 30 plus years, you know, so, um, you know, the whole period of Thatcherism in England uh, under Margaret Thatcher in, 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 in the 1970s, early 1980s. Um, some, of the, some of the great mobilizations against Margaret Thatcher, working class mobilizations and Black folks, yes, absolutely, but not only Black folks. Um, and the, form, the collapse of the former Soviet Union, right? And thinking about and meditating on the significance of, of, of that momentous change. Right? Um, uh, in terms of what it means for our understanding of social liberation and freedom today. So I would say in that sense, he absolutely has been the political poet par excellence, somebody who was very much influenced politically by Franz Fanon and also C.L.R. James, John LaRosa, uh, who was a, a famous publisher and poet from Trinidad originally in England, but also aesthetically influenced by people like uh, Amy Césaire, also from Martinique, like Franz Fanon what I refer to as Césaire realism, a kind of Césaire's particular brand of surrealism. And uh, uh, Kamal Brathwaite, the great Barbadian poet and uh, historian thinker. So um, yeah, he's really been that poet who, when you think about poetry, which is again tied to art and politics, he's, he's, he's that poet for me that in many ways embodies the conjoining of those two things. And you explore this with, to great effect in the book. I'm just going to hold it up so people can see it. Dread Poetry and Freedom, uh, Linton Kwesi Johnson. I'll put up an actual image so people can read that better. And I, one of the things I found fascinating about your book is the, is the, the depth to which you explore kind of the, the concept of a, the poet and their place within society. And I think, I think you, you then go forward and, and look at LKJ uh, as like a, a figure that you can kind of examine these questions through. So I want, I want to read from the prologue here. This is on page five. Of all art forms, I suggest that poetry is particularly well placed to articulate society's needs and to at least hint at social developments to come. In some cases, this ability not only reflects artists' rare gifts, but also their freedom to articulate in verse, and particularly in dread or destitute times, what others dare not say or cannot see. Great artists are often well placed, even best placed, to assist us as we probe human possibilities and poets are particularly well suited for this role. Can, can you expand on, um, on your thinking there a little bit? No, it's just a way of saying that, you know, artists 
in this case, poets often represent possibilities. Now, obviously, it's not going to talk about every single poet and every single writer, right? So many great writers are able to kind of hone into and capture and then reflect the aims and aspirations of a given people in a given moment. And that's, as I was saying earlier, what Linton Kwesi Johnson has done historically through his po poetry. You know, so, and you know, much of his poetry really does speak to dread or destitute times, times of desperation, right? But the duality of that is that in times of desperation, people often respond creatively, you know, to transform, uh, transform the environment and, and, and bring about um, genuine and substantial change, or at least work towards that. Um, and much of those efforts he has captured in his poetry. But then possibilities, it doesn't only speak to the moment. Possibilities also speaks to how we can anticipate the change that might come, even though we don't see the possibilities of that change today. So yes, it sort of involves uh, a little bit of faith, you might say, in a, in, a, in a certain kind of way. But really, it's about hope and human possibilities, seeing beyond the present and recognizing that, you know, and, 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 and this is like the peculiar purview, I would say sometimes of great artists is that they're able to kind of tap into what is present, but we don't necessarily see as mm -hmm. sort of, oh, you know, everyday people, right? So what we might, uh, we might describe as foresight, them seeing into the future is actually insight their insight into what's right beneath our noses that we don't capture, we, we can't capture and see in the same way. And poets like Linton Kwesi Johnson and others, uh, Kamal Brathwaite, and not many, I mean, too many poets to start listing them, right? They've had that, they have that, they possess that capacity or have possessed that capacity mm. to touch into our moment and to see beyond our moment too. Mm. Uh, you kind of put it in an interesting way on, on page, I think this is page 208. Um, you say, finally, art is the avant-garde of the human psyche recreating the future before its time, which I think ties into what you're saying very well. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's partly also coming from Brian Murphy, who's, um, <laughs> whose wonderful book, uh, Transforming Ourselves, Transforming the World, was recently republished, right? Mm -hmm. this, again, this idea that, you know, poetry sometimes allows us to see the best side of ourselves. It taps into, you know, the unseeable, right? Or the unforeseeable, right? In ways that um, allow us to be hopeful, right? Allow us to have that spirit, that sense that despite how things are today, there is a possibility of change tomorrow. It's interesting also, because on, on a recent episode, I talked with um, a former professor of mine and we talked about Russian formalism and uh, Mikhail Bakhtin's theories about the, the novel as a genre. And it's interesting to kind of, from my own mind, to compare that discussion of the novel as a genre to poetry as a form, because I think the novel, you know, it's at least in Bakhtin's formulation has a lot to do with different social speech types, different groups, different lexicons, all kind of combined together, you know, artistically organized by a creator or an author. Um, and I wonder to what extent poetry is a superset of that or, or contains that as well as has this, this other element of like a, an individual um, kind of struggling through formulating their own their own speech or their own voice. Like it's something you talk about um, on page 43. These experiential poems are the product of the creative labor of writing through the politics of the moment. An imminent undercurrent flows through many of his poems, this is LKJ, as mm -hmm. they reveal injustice and archive struggles for social change in times of dread. Um, do you think that do you think that the the singularity of the poet as a figure is one of the elements elements that separates poetry and, and say like a novel or a film uh, in, in terms of their style and their form? Well, I think maybe of, of the many art forms, right? And it depends on the poet and it depends on how a poet chooses to, to convey their art, their art. Um, you know, poets are not confined by the strictures and parameters of a, a social scientist, like a political scientist or a political theorist or a historian or whatever, who have to work with a particular methodology. Right? Which, well, writers in general, I think you could say, um, the difference being that, you know, poets often use this very kind of economic, economic use of language, right? So it's mm -hmm. sometimes very much more concise or precise. Um, you know, they don't have to worry. They can imagine and create without worrying about, you know, is it does it does does their art conform to a particular format or structure mm -hmm. the way we write an essay or the way mm -hmm. we're expected to write book with chapters and you know 
clean paragraphs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think, you know, poets and artists just have to do their art. Mm. They're mm. not, they're not, they're not, they're not restricted and bound that way. And I think that's what allows poets like Linton Crazy Johnson to express themselves with a kind of freedom and sense of possibility um, that they do. That said, you, you know, because you, you mentioned the words imminent undercurrent, you know, one of the things, one of the defining features of Linton Crazy Johnson, which I think is in part a product of the influence of, um, you know, his, his early reading outside of poetry and the influence of people like Franz Fanon, and I would say, and obviously C.L.R. James too, particularly James's books, Notes on Dialectics and uh, uh, the Black Jacobins, his book about the Haitian Revolution, mm -hmm. is there this, there's this, there's this, the use of dialect and dialectic and the interplay between those two things. So is that dialectic, this, this sense that out of tension, contradiction, right? Something new emerges, right? So that's the, the tension and the contradiction is, is the struggle. The tension and contradiction is, is what comes out of being, finding yourself in a context where anti-Black racism takes the form of um, neo-fascist attacks right? by the state and neo-fascist in the form of like the National Front and, and the police, right? And how is it that people respond? Uh, you know, the dialectic also plays itself out in terms of, um, you know, the internal tensions amongst Black folks that, that comes out in the form of what he refers to as fratricide in some of one of his poems, mm -hmm. um, basically internecine violence, right? Which then morphs itself when those who are engaged in internecine violence feel that they're capable of sort of struggling against the outside force, the state, that creates that internal tension in the first place. And so all there's this, that's the dialectic that's at play in his work, which of course, you know, the, is tied to his poetics, which takes the form of, you know, what is often, um, you know, described as dialect, which, but of course he's writing in his national language, which is referred to as Patwa. It's one of the many Creoles that exists in, in the Caribbean. The combination of those two things is one of the things that makes his poetic output unique, um, you know, and that dialectic thread through his, his later poems, the poems that are about socialism, is really about what, what were the tensions that created that disruption and pulled apart this thing that was presumed to be socialism, right, in the former Soviet Union, but then rather lamenting or moaning the demise of the former Soviet Union, right, and this is where you see the influence of C.L.R. James's um, notion of state capitalism, and his, and, and his analysis of the former Soviet Union as a state capitalist, state capitalist society. So in other words, capitalism that's administered by the, the kind of state structure and administration, right? um, which we saw in the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. Right? Rather than lamenting, right, in his poetry, we see this, this again, this, the, dialect of under, the dialect of understanding that, out, 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 and there's a line in one of the poems that says, sometimes the pungent odor of decay signals a brand new life upon the way, sometimes out of the chaos and decay, right? And near death, right? We see that new life emerges, something better. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's one of the unique, you know, I think that's in large part, given my own politics, what has drawn me historically to Lyndon Crazy Johnson's poetry. Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually a much more, I mean, some people might argue that, you know, these kind of high culture types um, from decades past might say, oh, you know, poetry is about transcendence and uh, the sublime, and it's this high art that shouldn't be sullied by things like material conditions and history, and I, which is why maybe I find your, your kind of analysis in this book so much more interesting, because it is grounded in a reality, but it's still very, very dynamic and um, kind of has its own unique kind of life. On page 17, you say art then including poetry as an expression of the material, ideological, and ecological world, which is given further expression in the creative process of its production. Very interesting line. This also raises the question of form. This is perhaps what Derrida means when he suggests that a poet is one who surrenders to the truth of language with its own inner meaning that is separate from what we might describe, in this case, as the poem's ideological meaning. And in the process, the poet resurrects language and breathes, breathes life into it so that it may speak to us, even if its speech exists in codes that are sometimes difficult to decipher. And I realize now when I type that quote out, I have a lot of uh, typos, so that's probably hard to decipher on its own. Um, like this, this is kind of what you're talking about in terms of the poet through the process of creating the poetry, 
is actually tied to all these historical conditions and all these social realities, their own personal history, but also they're able to, through that poetry, kind of take, take it beyond that and expand it into some a slightly more universal form that could actually speak to a wider group of people and, and touch on a, a top touch on topics that a, a large swath of humanity could really understand and grapple with, right? Absolutely. And you know, it's the particular experiences that make the universal. So I will suggest that one of the things that make Linton that makes Linton Crazy Johnson so unique and a poetry that resonates over the years, right? So that's when you know that a poet um, has done something special. They're still reading or listening to their poetry 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and who, who knows how much longer, right? Down the line. And he hones in on the particular experiences of people of African descent, Black folks in the UK. That's his point of departure. Mm -hmm. And even when he's writing about socialism, et cetera, he often comes back to that, right? But in those particular experiences, we find a reflection of humanity as a whole, absolutely, right? And that's what makes us also makes us poetry authentic, whereas sometimes people try to write universal poetry where they speak to everybody mm. and everything becomes a kind of nothingness. Mm. But you also mentioned something else there um, in relation to in relation to Derrida, you know, and and you know that reference to Derrida is is is, is tied to Derrida's writing about Paul Celan. Like the famous writer, who, writer poet who wrote, wrote in German. And that is that, like, you know, when I first started writing about Linton Crazy Johnson, the emphasis was on the poetry, was on the politics, right? Because there was a, poetic, a, po a politics there that spoke to me. Obviously, the language that he uses to convey those politics um, is what brought me into the poetry, too. But when I started writing about his poetry, I wasn't really taking the poetry as seriously as I, as I should as poetry. In other words, the aesthetics, the language that, see that, that um, Derrida speaks about, the language of poetry that has its own codes, its own language, it speaks in its own form. Right? Mm -hmm. That came later when I began to really think about, well, you know, how is it that his message is conveyed? Right? It's not just what he's saying, in other words, but how he's saying what he's saying. Right? And, it's, and, and, you know, sometimes, you know, you see descriptions of Linton Crazy Johnson's poetry where they emphasize the politics as if he's just doing politics in verse. But he is a poet, right? And some of his poetry is sublime, right? Some of his early yeah. poetry really is like, in terms of the vivid and colorful use of language and the range of poetic devices that he invokes in, in his poetry. And he's a, he is a poet's poet too. Yeah. It is also true that some of his poems were very deliberately written for propaganda purposes, literally, right? Yeah. When he was involved in various political movements and organizations, and mm. um, you know, was writing a particular poem in relation to a very particular moment. Mm. There's many less poetic or less poems, right? But they may not be quote unquote as poetic as some of his other poems that serve a different purpose. Mm. And you quote him here actually on this topic, uh, and this is on page 20. He says, if politics creeps into art unconsciously without the writer trying, that's often the most powerful expression of politics. But when the artists try to be political in their art, it usually ends up badly people do not like to be preached at. And I think this is a really important point when it comes to politics and literature and art is, you know, as soon as I, I think, I think the singularity of voice of a piece, a piece of propaganda when you're, when you're, when you're setting out to make a point is really one of the big creative problems there. I think, I think you're losing kind of the lifeblood and the interchange of different ideas and voices in your work. You know, if you write a movie that's just about hammering home one point in every scene, it's just not going to be creatively successful. Um, and I think that's a problem for a lot of people on the left at, who are making art and interested in art. They kind of look at it as like a propagandistic value mm -hmm. as opposed to a creative expression of human thought that will tie into subterranean and unconscious things um, in a profound way and powerful way, probably more powerful than if you just wrote an essay on it that was a nonfiction piece of, hey, this is what what's up, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think that... Uh... One of Linton Crazy Johnson's gifts is that absolutely he's a political poet, right? And most poets start with some kind of idea of where their poet is going to poetry is going to take them or where their poem is going to take them. Mm. But I think, I mean, my sense is that, you know, I, as a non-poet in the sense that Linton Crazy Johnson is a poet, is that great poems write themselves. Right? Mm. Might begin 
with an idea of where that poem is going to take you. Mm. But as Derrida is suggesting, poets have, poems have a logic of their own, right? Mm. And they sort of carry the poet at a certain point. Mm. Um, and when the poem takes its own form and takes the, the poet in a certain direction, and you choose to sort of, you know, confront or challenge or go in the opposite direction, that's when I think you get sort of propagandistic poems, which mm. do not be deliberately so, right? But they don't read as poems to us, right? Because they lose mm. the kind of aesthetic allure, I would say. For sure. Um, yeah, I sent you a link. I don't know if you're aware of this. And this is something that I find really fascinating in the current political climate. Like, you know, I went to university in the early 2000s, um, studied English literature, a lot of other things. But but when I fast forward to the current world, I, I just see a lot of the same you know, language I, I learned in studying English literature in university just deployed in all kinds of places I would not expect. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat cartoonishly, it, it showed up in this CIA ad that recently came out. Um, and I don't know if you had time to look at the clip or if no, you're aware of this, no. but it's it's basically this woman uh, who works for the CIA and she's quoting, uh, you know, a famous poet. I can't remember which poet it was. And she's talking, she's using the language that you would really find in almost like any literary journal. You know, she's basically like, she's basically saying like, I'm at the CIA, I'm beautiful. I'm a beautiful Latina woman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think we are really living in the age where the kind of poetry you might've read in university a decade ago is now the language that's been adopted by a, a pretty huge swath of the kind of liberal ruling class, certainly in America. Um, and I wonder, like your thoughts on, um, well, I, I kind of know the beginning of your thoughts on this. Um, on page 37, you say, Baraka also viewed poetry as a revolutionary weapon that deployed otherwise represented a distraction, an ornament that imperialists wear to make a gesture towards humanity. Do you think we're living in an age where, I mean, we can maybe expand it beyond poetry to talk about music and, and even popular music. Do you, do you worry that the liberatory capacity or at least the, the, the true kind of intellectual heft of something like poetry is potentially being degraded by people co-opting it for the means of, of kind of just putting a mask, a, a new mask on the face of power? Well, it's kind of easy to do that. It is easy to do that, right? Um, there was an ad not some time ago, I don't remember if it was with Nike. Maybe it was KRS One's version of the revolution will not be televised, right? Yeah. The yeah. Gil Scott, Gil Scott Heron poem. Yeah. That's probably inevitable. Right? Mm. Mm. Um inevitable in so far as what do we do about it, right? But mm. I think the, the concern for me is we're in a moment in which <clears throat> language often trumps substance. Right? So it's easy for folks to appropriate the right language right? and appear to have the best of intentions. Right? But then there's words and then there's actions or there's words and then there's, then there's meaning. Right? So we're in a moment right now in which you know, post uh, um, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd and the protests of last summer, mm -hmm. right? there, there are certain conversations that have been happening around race, anti-Black racism, right? And the need to kind of transform institutions that reproduce systemic racism, et cetera, right? And so, so in our moment, like folks who perhaps wouldn't have used the same kind of language just a year ago, right? It's become almost um, in vogue, right? To talk about privilege, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I mean, there are all the, there's all the kind of language that's sort of been passed down from academia, which is now part of the kind of common everyday, everyday speak. But ultimately, we're talking about the, the kind of change that disrupts power, mm -hmm. that changes power dynamics, that changes power relations. And discourse mm -hmm. or language alone doesn't do that, right? So we can find the fashionable language and like, you know, and sometimes it's, it's, it's the language that makes people sort of, you know, popular. Um, but beneath the language, we know that we're talking about the need for substantive institutional and structural, and I will say radical change. And I say radical, of course, because if we're not thinking about radical change in the best sense of that word, if we're not thinking with that sense of urgency in light of where the world is at, right? You know, so before COVID, we were talking about the environment. The pandemic itself has, has, has um, exposed the layers and levels of inequality in terms of who it's impacted locally in a national, and North American context, right? 
We see a lot of frontline workers, or people of you know, uh, black folks, people of color. We see how it's impacted indigenous communities. But then it's also exposed to global inequality on a national scale, international scale, sorry, in terms of like who has access to the vaccine and you know who, who's, whose health and well-being is put first. Mm -hmm. So within that context, if we're not talking about radical, substantive, substantive, genuine change, then 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 what are we talking about? So you know, the word radical is not just a, a word that's abused by folks who are sort of, you know, folks in positions of power who can look around the world and say there are these radical movements. Like, we, if we're not talking about radical change in our moment, then then what do we really mean when we're talking about talking about change? So sometimes we get caught up in the language and we need to kind of spell out in detail substantively what is it that we mean when we're talking about change right mm -hmm. and sometimes the language itself the buzzwords are not enough because the language can easily be co-opted yeah. the meaning behind the words can't and mm -hmm. that's when you realize that we're saying different things oftentimes mm. it's interesting yeah because i think like when you look at that cia ad you can kind of intuitively know what it's trying to accomplish it's someone kind of like burnishing these kind of uh these kind of literary flowers for their own self-interest you know i think like reading, reading, reading this book and then thinking about poetry and, it, and its purpose, you know, I think about when I was a teenage kid writing love poems, trying to impress a member of the opposite sex and, and my own, you know, as that, that, that as an expression of my own needs. And I think to a certain extent, you know, artists are, can just express their own needs and, 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 and people can kind of uh, sympathize with that and understand it. Obviously the best ones are ones that can speak to this kind of subterranean unsaid thing that's, that's under the surface. So yeah, I think you're probably right in that, like you can, we, we intuitively can kind of tell that this language is being co-opted in this instance. So maybe, maybe I'm over-concerned about that co-optation because well, you're right. Maybe, yeah, but the thing is, right, maybe somebody else will read that and not necessarily know that that's a CIA, CIA ad right away or, you know, or, or, or what it means like to, 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 for the CIA to be, you know, um, advertising itself. I, I've never seen that before. I'm not talking about the specific ad itself, not just the specific ad, but I've never seen a CIA, CIA commercial before, and even though they did commercials. Yeah, it's right? kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. What a world. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think in terms of like actual uh, material change that can be quantified, um, and you know, this is something that Marx talks about at great length and a lot of Marxian thinkers, but just people in general is the notion of time and free time. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I think the the time that people are given or, or the time that there's given that, 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 that space is given to to accomplish certain things is a very political question. Um, and you, you touch on you touch on the the, uh, the, the different ways in which Linton Quasi Johnson deals with time in his work, but I found this passage particularly interesting. You're quoting um, LaRose here. Uh, you say, in other words, LaRose argues that the forced exclusion and normalized quote unquote leisure of the underclass fosters creativity, offering hope that the world's socially excluded possess the potential to invent new possibilities of freedom or what he describes as marvels of reality that can eventually lay the seeds for a creative alternative to the contemporary global political economy. And what I found interesting about that passage was it was basically, oh, basically it's, it's a, a, a materialist or class-based analysis of like why say certain excluded social groups might actually have a higher degree of creative output. And part of it has to do with that forced exclusion, perhaps, or that forced, quote unquote, leisure time, which in many cases might just be like, you know, a complete lack of any kind of economic opportunity or, or prospects for employment, right? Um, and I, what I like about that is it kind of de-essentializes things in terms of race or gender or anything along those lines and says, no, it's actually a social context that this increase in creativity um, springs from. Do you think that that's, is that something you can speak more to? Well, that, you know, that was the promise, right, when folks, Marxists and others spoke about, you know, what would the new society and the good life look like? Right? It's having more time, as Linton Quasi Johnson says, for leisure, for pleasure, and all those things that we generally, as a, you know, as a society, don't have the time for because of, because of labor, the need to work. Um, <laughs> But John LaRose takes it in a very interesting way in two directions, right? Because if we go back to ancient Greece, for example, ancient Athens, right? Which yeah, the school called, means leisure. That's what yeah. it is, yeah. Right. But then, you know, the, the flip side of the leisure time that Athenian citizens had is tied to the fact that there were slaves doing the work of Athenians. That's part of, that's part of the historical reality, right? Mm. Now, in a different context, right? 
you take North American society and take the United States for a second there and the Caribbean, right? That same leisure time was afforded, um, you know, the planter class because of slavery too, mm. right? Um, and in this, in the world that we live in today, it's the affluent that have that leisure time, right? To, mm. to produce, to relax, to write, to create. Although what John LaRose is saying, which I find very interesting, which I had never thought about the way he describes it before. So absolutely, people like C.L.R. James and other people have talked about the creati creativity comes from, from, from down below. And if you look mm -hmm. at like the popular forms of music, reggae, the blues, and jazz, right? It's situated in those places. Okay? Mm -hmm. But he describes it in terms of forced leisure time, right? It's not mm -hmm. leisure time because people are affluent. Mm -hmm. It's leisure time that people have as a result of the absence of work, right? Mm -hmm. The absence of being able to 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 engage in the labor process because uh, because of unemployment unemployment or underemployment, you know. In other words, you know, there's a permanent layer, the permanent underclass, and I and I can tell you because my 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 family's from a, a particular part of Jamaica, mm. right? Which is which is the place where where we're in the '60s and '70s. A lot of the great music which we've come to know and love and take for granted, like ska and reggae. Much of it was produced in those spaces, in those neighborhoods, right? Where people were part of a kind of permanent underclass, right? Yeah. Sometimes in and out of the working class. So so um, I, I like the way that John LaRose, who was a huge influence on Linton Crazy Johnson, by the way. Yeah. You know, his Linton Crazy Johnson's poem, poem, More Time, very much reflects, I think, some of that influence, although, it's sometimes hard and, and also dangerous to kind of speak about direct influences between, you know, poets and, you know, because like all kinds of things can be infused into a poem. But he's talked about the impact of John LaRose on him. And, and I think you, you, you see that influence in the poem more time, where this, this, this idea that like, that, that we, 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 you know, if, if we want to live a different kind of life, I want to live a radically, to radically change society, right? We need to imagine or rethink what labor and work means in the here and now, right? Mm -hmm. Because right now we 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 barely have time. Most of us barely have time to breathe. Right? Mm -hmm. Work becomes the thing itself. Work becomes society itself, right? Not our human encounters or yeah. just the time to to think and create. Well, it's interesting because you know you look at like the labor movement in the early twentieth century and fighting for things like the forty hour work week, which has now just become completely reified. No one even really, outside of maybe Spain, is considering even reconsidering the 40-hour work week, which probably had as much of a kind of revolutionary impact on the human experience as anything else, you know, mm -hmm. because they, people weren't working themselves to the bone seven days a week anymore. And I think the concept of like time and the, and the, and the fight over time and anxiety over time is something that for sure needs to be uh, considered more. Um, but you know, know something, Isaac, what's, what's, what's interesting about that is that, you know, look at the moment that we're in right now with this pandemic. Mm. and how many people have been put out of work, right? On the one hand, we can see all the resources that have been poured into sort of subsidizing folks so that they can still pay their rent, consume, et cetera, because that's, what, that's part of the machinery that, 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 that runs the economy, right? But what happens if like, creatively speaking, we imagine the society being structured in a different way, where instead of so many people working 40, 50 hours a week, right? We have more people working 30 to 25 hours a week, right? And we know that it's possible, right? Because we see how, just how under these emergency circumstances, all kinds of quasi-creative ideas are kind of brought into being to, so that folks can adapt and transition to whoever we're transitioning to. Sure. Right? So, so, so it's not a lack of possibility, it's not the impossibility of that, you know, of, of, of a shorter working day and a shorter working week, et cetera. Right, it's a lack of will, right? Mm, yeah, and it's, it's a way in which power exercises itself, or the powerful exercise power, right? And it's a form of control. Yeah, I think that came up a lot during the stimulus check debate. You know, people were saying, "Oh, you know, we we can't. We've already given you six hundred dollars. We're only going to give you another twelve hundred, not the sixteen hundred. And I think uh, I think it was the guys on Chapo Trap House that had the great point of saying that they're just trying to shut it down because once they give out the money. All their bullshit about, you know, we got to be fiscally responsible. It will be revealed to be complete nonsense because they demonstrate that the money is there. Exactly. But the exactly. Mm -hmm. um, now, before before we end, I did want to talk to you about LKJ's poetry and, and kind of its elegiac nature, which I find really fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and thank you so much for coming on. We'll have to try and invite you on oh, as, as soon as possible here. Um, author, we're speaking with author David Austin and his book, uh, Dread Poetry and Freedom, Linton Quasey Johnson and the Unfinished Revolution. I love the cover, by the way, cover by Melanie Patrick, photo by Adrian Hoot mm. as well. Um, let's see, let me find the page. A lot of people here. commented on the cover, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? There you go. Way to go. Retro is cover. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so this is page 167. Um, and this this ties into um, all, all the influence of the Bible in, in Jamaica and in Rastafarianism as well. Um, if, as Derrida argues, and this is from page 167, if, as Derrida argues, poetry is about the revenant that both haunts and returns, not in the sense of Christian glory, but in terms of resurrection of language, then Johnson revives the language and lore of the biblical resurrection in order to resuscitate socialism. Um, and you also go into great detail in the book about the, the elegiac nature or, or themes of his, of his work. Can you, uh, can you speak to the audience a little bit about what, what, why perhaps uh, LKJ deployed the, the, the language of elegy so often in his poetry? Sure. Now, so Linton Quayley Johnson, as far as I know, is still an atheist, right? So he's not religious, but he's right. from a particular part of Jamaica where he grew up until the age of 11 in Clarendon, Clarendon, where, you know, Jamaica, according to what we know, has more, more churches per capita than any place in the world, right? So everybody, and particularly of the earlier generations, is very familiar with the Bible, even if they're not literate, right? So he would read the Bible to his grandmother and became very, very sort of, um, you know, um, some of his favorite passages from some Psalms or, you know, Song of Solomon, et cetera. So very familiar with the Bible. And in his early poetry and in some of his later poetry, you see elements of the Bible in terms of the use of language, right? From the King James Version of the Bible, but also biblical metaphors, right? Um, in, in, in a lot of his poetry. So in his poetry on socialism, for example, the poem, The Good Life, which is in part an elegy for C.L.R. James. Right? He invokes, you know, this idea of the, you know, the, the, the biblical wise old shepherd leading mm. the, the flock, right? And then they inverts it and talks about the flock will now lead the shepherd, right? And then there's this kind of vivid description of, you know, this 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 figure lying on its back near death, like with a white, you know, like a, like with a white cushiony, white hair. Um, on his bronze head. He's describing actually, um, as far as I can tell, the image of C.L.R. James, right? When he talks about the resurrection of this thing called socialism, right? right? And how the flock will take stock and surmise, how far from the fold they're straying, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, elegies have been a, a kind of central part of much of his poetry. Elegies for particular individuals like his father, for Walter Rodney, the, the great uh, historian and a Marxist thinker and, and political figure, and also for C.L.R. James in this poem, The Good Life, right? But in elegizing figures, they also become, and this is what often happens with elegy, they also become the embodiment of an experience or of a people, right? So in elegizing those individual figures, like in Reggae Fedata, for example, he, in elegizing his father, he's talking about uh, the kind of um, decay of Jamaican society politically at the same time. Mm. In Reggae for Rodney, yes, it's about Walter Rodney, but it's about what is politics and how do we fight and struggle for meaningful social change, mm. right? And in this elegy, The Good Life, which is dedicated to C.L.R. James, it's about the death and resurrection of this thing called socialism, largely kind of concluding that this thing, as I mentioned earlier, this thing called socialism or communism as it existed in the former Soviet, Soviet Union, right, was not really communism. It wasn't genuine, right, because mm. it was like the, the, the leader or the shepherd leading the flock, mm. whereas Linton Quady Johnson suggests, and as C.L.R. James used to argue, it's the flock that are supposed mm. to lead the shepherd. In other words, mm. if we're talking about this thing called socialism in any kind of serious way, it's about so-called ordinary people playing the central and direct participatory role in terms of making decisions that affect their day-to-day -day lives. Right? Mm. In other words, there's no division between a party and politics. The mm. people become the party and the politics, not, mm. not their representatives, not, not professional politicians, right? Which is, you know, in part, 
if we forget about the slavery part in ancient Greece and the fact that women were not citizens in ancient Greece for a while in ancient Athens, right? In part, that's that's what happened in Athens at its height, right? Ordinary citizens played an active participatory role on rotation. Mm, mm. So that's what in 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 you know when he talks about the death and resurrection of socialism, he's mm. talking about its resurrection in a new form, not in the old form, because the old form was moribund. It's very interesting, I think, um, and you mention on, you quote uh, LKJ on page 173, the poet's persona also wonders whether the days of the individual leader directing his flock to the promised land are over. And there's mm -hmm. another there's another uh, page where you talk about how, you know, the dispossessed, those living in dread times don't need to be taught about Marxism. They could actually probably teach Marxists a thing or two. And maybe as a closing thought, and maybe to plant a seed for a future discussion, um, because I want to talk about, uh, I can never, I always mix up the, the public enemy title and the title of your other book, Fear of a Black Nation. Because, I mean, here, here's a question though. Like, I mean, there's going to be a lot of Bolsheviks that listen to this podcast. I'm, I'm trying to pitch as big, big of a tent as possible, but there's definitely some Bolsheviks on there. Maybe as a closing thought, you could, you could speak to, and this is maybe one of the questions that initially uh, made me seek you out is, is this question of, what does uh, the black experience or say like uh, Marxist thinkers from Africa, what does that have to offer in terms of extending and perhaps being kind of a true fulfillment of Marxian thinking? Like is the black Marxist tradition as critical to the development of Marxism as, as I suspect it is? Well, you know, and it brings me back to C.L.R. James. So, C.L.R. James in his book, The Black Jacobins. Mm -hmm. About the Haitian Revolution, yeah. Yeah, so people read it as a history of the Haitian Revolution through the biography of Toussaint Louverture. Mm. I read it as a book of political theory mm. and political economy. Mm. And, and, and I'm sure there are other people that do the same. Right? So I don't say, I don't want to say I do as if I'm the only one. But that's my, that's how I read that book. And in it, he talks about, there's a, there's a, there's a line in part where he talks about the, the slaves on the north plain of Haiti in San Domingo, which what eventually became Haiti, right? Um, engaged in the production of sugar. So not just cutting sugar cane on plantations, but the whole production of sugar, which is like a, you know, involves like a kind of factory-like structure and it's a complicated distilling process, right? He says those slaves were, you know, at that time, and they're talking about in the, in the early 1700s, late 1780s, closer to anything that approximated the proletariat Mm. Than anything that existed in Europe during that time. Mm. Now, in saying that, what he's trying to do is recenter our understanding of the history of capital, capitalism, number one, mm. but also then, because he's talking about a slave revolution, right? The history of resistance, labor resistance, number two, right? So it recenters in a way that we so the way that we look at so-called labor rebellions. Mm. The biggest one being the Haitian Revolution, which becomes a revolution, not just a rebellion, but you can think about the Maroon Rebellions, the Taki Rebellion in Jamaica, all across the Americas, right? Mm. It's laborers, slaves, like the embodiment of laborers who are rebelling. So why is that not part of the genealogy mm. of labor resistance and the mm. history of the labor movement, right? There's mm. no reason, there's no reason, aside from an arbitrary distinction. Now, of course, it begins to a certain extent with Karl Marx because he was primarily focused on the emergence of modern of the emergence of capitalism mm -hmm. in the European context and believed mm -hmm. that it was the European working class that were going to be at the core of this movement for international socialism. Mm -hmm. That's okay, right? Marx did a number of tremendous things. He was a brilliant, genius, great thinker, but he couldn't get everything right and mm -hmm. couldn't be all things to all people. So part of what black Marxism does, and I, you know, I kind of resist that language sometimes because, you know, you know, sometimes we get kind of lost in the words, but it's the meaning of it, right? Part mm. of what it does is allow us to think beyond this kind of European conception of history, mm. this European conception of progress, mm. and this European conception of socialism, and mm. recognize that, number one, as I said before, um, slavery, and slaves right are an integral part of the labor movement right but also slave labor was constitutive of capitalism mm. 
In other words, like, you know, where do the raw materials and resources, right? And also labor come from that allowed Europe, particularly the European powers, Spain, Portugal, and of course mm -hmm. later the capitalism, France, England, and also Germany, mm -hmm. right? That capital of accumulation, where does it, you know, where does it in large part come from? And particularly we talk about England mm -hmm. and France. Mm -hmm. You know, something that I tell my students sometimes, and I think, and, and, and I, I see the look in their face because it's, it, it's, it's quite something to consider. Slavery is not even quite half of the island of San, Santo Domingo, right? It shares it with the Dominican Republic. And at one point, it was responsible for close to 70% of France's export trade, right? Which explains why Napoleon almost lost you know, almost destroyed his army trying to recapture it, right? Mm. Which is part of the story that James recounts in, in that book. But that's just an example of the political economy, mm. right? Associated with slavery, right? Which of course is tied to race and racism because of the, the, the sort of the, 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 the racial codes that were attached to slaves of African descent, where mm. slavery and being African or mm. black became synonymous, which was something new, mm. right? It wasn't true in, pre in previous periods of history, like somebody could be a slave for various other reasons, right? But it wasn't tied to the ethno-racial background mm -hmm. almost on a permanent basis. Exactly, right? yeah. So, so in terms of thinking about racial capitalism, I mean, black capitalism and, and, and racial capitalism, et cetera, it's a way of trying to understand how the codes associated with race have this continuity, even in the afterlife of this thing called slavery, of the institution of slavery. Right? Mm. And they still play themselves out, but not only in racial terms, though, even though folks are racialized, right? Because, mm. of course, those codes, in terms of how they impinge on people's lives, it plays itself out in terms of people's labor, in terms of who gets to be considered, you know, a full human in terms of the interaction with the police, in terms of the interaction with the institutions of, you know, the body politic, um, and um, generally serves to eclipse the life chances of people of African descent. Now, I'm talking specifically about people of, Afri of African descent in this context because we're tying it to the history of colonization and slavery of a particular kind. But of course, you know, um, other groups of people, including obviously indigenous peoples, are you know experience racialization associated with colonization in, in its in its own right. Now, yeah, so that's what I would say, and I and I just want to say something which is going to seem completely out of the water and unrelated. Go for it. That's part of our brand here. It's all good. But it's important to say something. Like, mm. You know, we should all be troubled, not just concerned, troubled and outraged with what is happening to Palestinians right now. Yes. And we can't not say something about that. Right? Because yeah. we about dispossession. Yeah. Right? And, and complicity in terms of how, you know, the lives of Palestinians can just be sort of effaced and erased and it's deemed acceptable. And any attempt to sort of make any criticism is shut down completely. And the media has played a complicit role, it's outrageous. And mm. we we can't in good conscience not say anything about it. We absolutely cannot. It's and true. We cannot allow it to continue. Yeah, we talked about it a, uh, to, to start off the, uh, the last episode. It, it definitely makes sense to end on that. I mean, it's um, it's interesting to me how how weaponized language has become in this mm -hmm. in this case um you know i think i think actually and something that's been on my mind a lot lately is this and i'm sure it came out of some kind of think tank or focus group this this phrase that israel has quote unquote a right to exist and i think that's a powerful phrase for people because of the subtext of it because of what it speaks to in terms of world war ii and the Absolutely. holocaust and the fact that jewish people in that context were very much not allowed did not were not conceived to have a right to exist that being said applying that to a state actor which is i mean first of all i don't know how you fucking claim to be a liberal democracy if you're dropping bombs on your own people i don't really know how that's a liberal thing to do you know the quote unquote only democracy in the middle east but i mean really like a, a problem for me is you know if 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 and I don't, I don't want to use this language, of, but obviously like the Canada and the US are a major ally of Israel and, and they're part of a global kind of security apparatus. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think, you know, given that they are, in the sense that they are friends, a good friend will tell a friend when they're doing something harmful to themselves. And what Israel's been doing in expanding the settlements for the last 20 years, completely delegitimizing de and destroying the Palestinian Authority. Obviously, they also created Hamas in its original form years ago. These there's are all tacit, things that are undermining their own consent. security. There's yeah. tacit consent. And yeah. silence is a form of consent. Right? Yeah. So it's tacit consent. And, you know, I just wanted to say, because I, you know, this is a whole other conversation that, but it's not that complicated, right? Mm. So if we take the, the same language that you just used, right? Mm. Israel has a right to exist. Yeah. What's the, what's the, what's, what's the inverse of that or the opposite side of that? Do Palestine, that does Palestine have, have a right to exist? Yeah. It doesn't have, and Palestinians don't have a right to exist. Yeah. So, so what is being, what's, what's, what's the argument and the logic behind it in saying that, 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 that at all costs, regardless of the human cost of Palestinians, right? The state of Israel should be allowed to do what it does. Mm. Yeah. No, of course, like, and you know, it, it bears mentioning, right? Because yes, anti-Semitism does exist. We know what happened during the second world war to Jews. Of course mm. we do. Palestinians should not be paying the price for that. For the, do Palestinians need to pay the price for the crimes of Europeans? No, of course not. I mean, it's the, it's the ultimate expression of colonialism and neocolonialism for these people that had nothing to do with that to be asked to be bear the brunt of it. Yeah. Palestinians should not be paying that price. No, yeah. no, it's disgusting. And, and you know, the rioting and just, just like mob violence and people just going into people's homes and saying, this is my home now. Um, you know, uh, I really... I don't know. I'm, I'm disturbed by the level to which the mainstream narrative has really just become really buttoned down and very and, and formulated in a very, very clear way that's meant to support one side. But I, and I this came up on the last episode as well. I wonder if the fact that, like, you know, you read the BBC and it's really, really one sided and it's been going that way more and more and more over the last decade and a half, if maybe that's allowing for people like U.S. Uh, pe people in the U.S. Congress and whatnot to actually feel like, you know what, if I don't speak out against this, no one's going to. Um, like, I'm not it's, sure. It's tacit consent, you know, you know, not only just the silence, but the way things are framed to make it appear as though both sides are equal. Yeah. The one side is a superpower in that context, right? And the other side is fighting for their lives. Yes, there's complexity in between all of that. We know that, right? Yeah. You know, there are internal complexities in, in Palestine, but I'm saying Palestinian civilians should be paying this price. Hmm. It's outrageous and, 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 you know, nobody can afford to be silent on this anymore. It's, yeah. it's, it, 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 we just can't. And I think, you know, that's just, um, you know, yeah, I think that statement speaks for itself and it's probably a good place to end, but to be continued. It's a yeah. completely outrageous and I, and I don't see how any, any person, Jewish, non-Jewish, can watch this thing unfolding. Mm and not feel a sense of outrage, right? Yeah. And sometimes that's the, the litmus test, right? Is like when you're most implicated and affected, right? Mm. What is your position? Mm. Yeah, I think I think my 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 hope that given that, you know, things are just so obviously cartoonishly out of control um, and worse than they've been in decades now that maybe like, like I feel as though this probably was something that existed in the Vietnam era too, where people on the left and, and activists of all type would say, look at the Vietnam War, this is proof that, we're not living in a moral universe. Our, our society is not living in, a, in, in any kind of moral or ethical territory. And I wonder if this, this latest violence in Israel and Palestine kind of will wake people up to that same fact that like, you know what, we actually have to confront the fact that the systems we've created, the political classes that we have empowered and engaged with are, are just not living in an ethical world. They just, they just, ethics and morality just don't exist in that universe. And, Maybe yeah. that's the first step to kind of changing things. I'm not sure. No, we can hope because people have been woke for some time, right? But it, it's like, are those who are in positions of power and authority, are they willing? And this, historically, the answer has been no. It's when people mobilize and push and fight and struggle. Mm. That's when change occurs, right? Yes, it may take the form of politicians making, taking certain decisions or passing certain laws or whatever the case may be, yeah. but they don't do it on their own volition. Right? So, so they're it's being like pressured, or, yeah. Organization and mobilization. And you know, we need to be mobilized and rallying around because this is this is just it's outrageous.
It's absolutely yeah. outrageous. Yeah, could not agree more. Um, listen, David, so wonderful uh, speaking with you. I've really, I really enjoyed reading the book. I can't wait to talk about the next one. Um, thank you so much for uh, for your eloquence and and all your hard work. And yeah, you know, I even just wanted to say, you know, it's 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 just a it's rich with references and information, but uh, written in a really readable and really tremendously enjoyable style. So um, so everyone should uh, definitely pick up Dread Poetry and Freedom, Linton Quasi Johnson and the Unfinished Revolution. And I'll definitely be inviting you on probably sooner than you're even comfortable with. <laughs> so oh, um, I, I hope we can squeeze it in and continue the conversation and uh, much love, uh, much appreciate your time. Anytime. Thanks a lot. Okay. Take and care. Take care. Same to you. <laughs>